Those of us who own a small business are self-reliant. We're driven by freedom, by choice, by ownership. Small business people are optimistic, the kind of optimism that's rooted in a great idea. We can create jobs, we can create wealth, we can make the world a better place. Small Business 2000 with Patty Bryant. The founders of this country were small business owners. I am convinced that every adult American has an idea for a business. We take the risk believing that this idea will work. When you have your own business, you're free to act on those ideas. So we can't just do the ordinary, we have to do the extraordinary. Small Business 2000 is made possible by support from IBM, serving the needs of small and growing businesses, and Mass Mutual, the blue chip company, ensuring the success of generations of family firms and growing businesses for 150 years. Hi, and welcome back. If you have a business and want to grow it, or if you're thinking about starting a business, the next 30 minutes could be invaluable to you. Most businesses stay small, but now you're going to meet a woman who is growing a business and growing it fast. Also, Jim Shell is here, our veteran entrepreneur. Jim has started and sold four businesses, and today he writes about his experience as a small business owner. He will convince you that a written plan of action is well worth the time invested. Stephen Jackson will show us some new word processing software. It will save us time and make us look more professional. If you've been watching this series every week, you know we offer the Small Business Masterclass. For those of you who have not been with us, let me explain to you exactly what this is. A masterclass is not taught by a teacher or an academic, and you will find no gurus or journalists in this session. What you'll find is a professional small business owner explaining to you exactly how they do what they do. Finding the master small business owner is not easy, and I wouldn't want to waste your time and bring you someone who doesn't have a lot to say. So let me warn you right now, grab a pencil, Cheryl Womack talks fast, and she's going to teach you a lot. The whole reason I started a business was to be in control of my destiny. You can't end up worse than even. I have never, ever gotten caught, caught up on a pride issue because if they're going to pay me, it's money in the bank, and I'll cash my pride in at the bank. In 1981, in her basement with one telephone and call waiting, Cheryl Womack started an association. Today, she has 75 employees and will see 45 million in revenues this year. And the name of the company is VCW. Inc. Inc. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, tell me. Stands for very cute women. Very. <laughs> <laughs> it's a girl thing. It's a girl <laughs> thing. And it's mainly a girl place. You have, mm -hmm. You've yes, allowed a few men in, but... The good ones. The, uh, the, the few you could find. Right. Like the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> we tell them that, men, too. A few good men. And they're wonderful. That's great. On the NAFTA highway between Minneapolis and Laredo, we met some of her customers at Carl's Corner, a one-of-a-kind truck stop. An owner-operator, an independent truck driver, is not, he is a businessman. If he does not have good business sense, he's not going to make it. They don't make the money they used to make. The people out there that's running up and down the interstate used to could drive four, five days a week, make a good living. Now they got to drive seven. It takes a certain kind of breed to be a truck driver. Cheryl has over 8,000 truck drivers in her National Association of Independent Truckers. In addition, many of the country's large motor carriers who hire independent truck drivers are her customers. She offers cost-effective insurance coverages, retirement benefit plans, low-interest credit cards, and more to her members. Cheryl's customers move the world. I mean, they move everything we use every day. There are about 300,000 independent truck drivers in the U.S. In 1994, 353 billion miles were logged by all trucks used for business purposes. We're running the United States. We run it. All we got to do is stop. And so do you. I worked for a gentleman here in Kansas City who actually was the founder of the idea of putting insurance on independent contractors separate from employees. And he developed the concept and idea, and I came on board and worked for him for about five and a half years. And after five and a half years, he decided to bring um, a gentleman in that I started in business with at Fireman's Fund and asked, him to, asked me to train him to be his boss. And I did all the money, so he was paying him twice my pay and giving him a company car. 
And I said, well, okay, I guess I better go. And I didn't know what I was going to do, but the more I thought about it, I took six weeks off. The only six weeks I've probably ever taken in my life off since about 12. And my husband promised he'd keep a roof over my head and keep me fed and I could do what I wanted to do. So I found myself just migrating back toward this line of work found a market in about four months that would write the business and started my own agency. Whether I did it subliminally or whether I did it more deliberately, I only hired women for a while because women are very detail oriented, very, women are very customer service oriented. Um, they could do a lot of the things to bring the skills to a service company that I needed and, at, and we were certainly small enough starting in my basement that I could handle the financial pieces and things like that. Although not even knowing how to read a financial statement, it did take a while. All right, okay. So at 31, you started your own business. Mm -hmm. How did you get the first piece of business and, and how did you fund yourself? Your husband sort of funded the, no, the household? No. no. Well, my husband certainly paid for me to live. Okay. okay. Actually, that's not true. I left that husband. Oh my God! Oh, this is good! <laughs> I'm sort of on a roll to change my life. What can I say? I left that husband, moved in with my sister for about three months and then got an apartment. Apartment. I was making about 17000 a year. I dated to eat, um, which was something you could do back then, for God's sakes. It was wonderful. It was a financial thing. Oh, my God. Oh my God that's the best thing we've ever taken. <laughs> I dated to eat. I did. You got it, Quinn? I oh, figured it was a great it. date. They'd buy dinner. You know, and if they wanted more than dinner, I'd pay for the dinner. Cheryl is the third of 11 children. Her father immigrated to the U.S. from Panama, and she believes his influence played a significant role in her choice to start her own business. Partly because I'd watch my dad be the boss, and I always grew up saying, I'm going to be him, not her. My dad spoke to us like we were adults and talked about the world as we were adults. Dad made us pay rent to live in the house once we had full-time jobs. The Managerial Woman was, uh, was a book written in 1967 or so. And the research on these women who had made it to management positions in large companies said that they had the attention of their father. Yes. And I think some of the courage that it takes to step out comes from our fathers. Mm -hmm. Our fathers blessing us mm -hmm. and saying, you can do it. He treated you like an adult. He expected you to pay rent. Exactly. Just like the boys. Just like the boys. All I ever wanted to do and all I ever want is to be in control of my destiny. By 50, my lifetime plan has been not to work. Well, I don't think I won't be working, but I'll only choose what I want to do. I mean, part of what I've just recently done with the employees here by all the promotions we've just done is to make sure people start practicing in place the next four and a half years what they're going to do taking it on I'm gonna sell the business to the employees these three primary businesses so that they will run it and profit themselves I'm benefiting now I'll benefit later because I'll maintain some of the ownership but it gives me all choices it gives me total flexibility on what I want to do with my life and that's what I wanted you did not necessarily copy the business you came from no I didn't copy it how, how did you make it different when you started at the end of, of my term with the previous employer, a lot of things were changing in how you could write policies and who needed to be the policy owner. And one of the issues were really that um, you couldn't be a master policyholder in the name of the trucking company and take care of the independent contractors. It needed to be either in their name or in some master name. And so I started an association so that I would have an association to make the named insured. And that was a trip. To do that, though, to be legal, then I have to come up with benefits. What right. other things okay. can I give them? But because of a, a change in the industry, in the law. it sparked an, your imagination, mm -hmm. and you created the association, the National Association for Independent Truckers, right. in order to be the umbrella for Over the insurance Whatever else products, may come out of it, yes. Plus other things. And that's another teaching point. Exactly. What can we do to help our customers make their lives easier, make them more profit? A convention of woes is gold dropping from heaven because if you can answer their problems you have a product to sell and it doesn't have to be sophisticated you have to go back and reiterate their concern and problem to them and go I think I have an answer help me you can't be the know-it-all because they don't want to hear it most of them especially in trucking or guys older guys and especially and you, big businesses the bigger the business the more it better be their idea mm -hmm. so you almost want to go to them and say you know I heard you talking about this and you've given me an idea so that it is their idea even mm -hmm. though they maybe had no clue they had such an idea and then they start to embrace it and take it on. Cheryl, do you think that women are better at that than men? So much better, it's not even funny. In the first place, they hear it. Men are so often on a quick sale, zoom, 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 going in for the clothes, they don't even hear what the person's really trying to 
say, here's what my need is, here's what my concern is. And that, I mean, women are gold at that. Not that a man can't do it and some can, but I think the empathy from a woman, um, that she's been raised her entire life to be that way. Mm -hmm. Let's hope we do a better job with our sons and they are that way too. When I walked into your space, I said, whoa, it's obvious a woman runs this business. It's beautiful, it's decorated, it feels homey almost. Good, it, it, you're here it, a lot. Comfortable, <laughs> yeah. okay, all right, you're here a lot. Right. The office, at one point in time in our, in our previous, not the one before, but the previous office was prettier than my home. It, it was, you're always there. And it was like, you know, if you're gonna be here working all the time, this should be a wonderful place to come to. And we have casual days, and, and I am probably the worst about taking advantage of casual days because I like to be casual. But um, I think for a lot of them, it makes a big difference to come in and be proud. It helps them grow. I mean, you can't put them in a, do me office and then send them on the road in a beautiful hotel and have them not be intimidated. I mean, everything I do here, even though they're nice things to do for employees, cultivate and grow those employees. Nice parties twice a year means that person dresses up in their finest garb, goes out, eats in a really nice restaurant, has to make social conversation with some of our guests and visitors, so that the first time they go on a road trip to sit down at a nice dinner with a customer, that wasn't their first time. I mean, I pretty much want them to have flown, to have had nice dinners, to have been in meetings talking to customers, to have done some demonstrations before they ever hit the road. I mean, it's just, I can't imagine how, and you can't just train that. You've got to give them real life experiences. Part of the real life experience at Cheryl's Companies is great home style food, prepared on site and available to employees for just $3 a day. And daycare, good for business as well as families. The parents are really close, so and they work with us very well. You think a woman-owned business is better at doing this than? I think so. I do because women have an understanding of the importance of having parents and and daycares and working in here. I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a big benefit. If I struggled with having babysitters there and consistent coming to my home, mm -hmm. and I was the boss and made pretty good money, I couldn't imagine if you were trying to do it on the regular normal routes. Right. And. I also watched people run out the door at a quarter of six, having to be there at six, and it wasn't feasible, wondering if they'd crash and burn on the way, you know, or pay some huge fine. So it answers a lot of things. It certainly stops turnover. Employees don't come back sooner than six weeks because the daycare won't let kids in shorter than six weeks or they'll come back sooner. Um, I mean, there, there's every reason for why, as a parent, you, you as the employer should want your kids and parents to have that experience together. You can nurse them because they're here and take that time mm -hmm. and you'll have an employee who's very dedicated and care very much about the success of this company so that they have those benefits. When it comes to getting people to think, you're not asking people to just do their job. No, we're asking them to do much more than their job every day, to think, recreate, um, redesign their job and take ownership for their job. It's not about time, it's more about I have this job and it was trained a certain way, and that doesn't mean it's necessarily the perfect way to do this job. If I were doing this job with no previous instruction, now that I have a basic understanding, what could be better and different? Okay, How you could, encourage that. We encourage suggestions. We pay a lot of cash for suggestions. What do you mean a lot of cash? Well, thousand bucks for an idea. We've always, as a company, put 15% of their pay in profit sharing every year, whether we made 3% profit or whether we made 200% profit, um, because if I think I'm getting the most out of you that you have to give, how could I give you less? I mean, I think you're entitled to it. Um, it, t it pays for me as well as it pays for you. It's our profit sharing. Um, it's unfortunate we're capped, but we are. Right. Um, and so with that, some of that money, not all of that money, I'm also creating cash for them to be able to buy me. Part of the culture that you've created is the way it is because of an expectation. When you turn 50, you're going to sell about 65% of the business to the employees. Um, why? Well, when I started the business, I never started it with a lifelong dream to own it to my end. I started it to create the ability for me to make choices in my life. So these three businesses really were just stepping stones for me. And they are, other than myself, the only reason the business is what, what it is today. And those who stay with the business deserve to own the business. Okay, do you think that men, and maybe even other women business owners as well, want to hang on to their business till they die because that is their identity? Oh, I think so. I absolutely, but, but this company is not my identity. I mean, I, I really am a, I'm a, I'm a very different, I mean, I, I have a big influence on this company and how it is and how it appears to people, but there are lots of other influences here and this company is not me.
Cheryl Womack started her business because her former employer did not respect her talent. He did not give her an opportunity to excel, to achieve. He did not recognize the fact that she was the one responsible for much of his business's growth. So when she started her business, she was determined not to make the same mistake this employer made with her. She is creating a situation for people to succeed. She has a beautiful work setting. She offers home cooked meals every day for lunch for just $3. There's a daycare. There's flexible dental and health plans. Um, she asks people to expand their jobs and then she rewards them for doing that. She gives cash for ideas. A friend of mine said, there are no inferior people, only inferior environments. Think about the workplace you are creating. Think about the way people feel when they come into that space. Do they feel good? Think about the way people feel when they are in your presence. Do they feel good or are they scared or intimidated by you? I want you to think about the job that each person has. Are you expecting them to expand it and grow it? Do you reward people when they do expand their jobs? The difficulty in managing people is it's not a science, it's an art. And I asked Cheryl, do you see yourself as a boss or a mentor? She immediately said mentor. Use the word mentor. Think about mentoring, nurturing, cultivating people. And if you're not doing that now, you need to think about how you can change. Oh, Paula! Happy anniversary! Two years, now three, and a baby. Yes, congratulations! I cried because this is my lifetime dream. And just you're doing to be it. able to cook. And I just love the appreciation I get from everybody for doing it. Paula, when you first came here, were you cooking then? No. What were you doing? I was a uh, customer service uh, rep trainee. And one day I brought snacks for people, and they all loved them, and Cheryl found out about it somehow. <laughs> that you could cook? <laughs> yeah, and so I, um, they decided to try me out for a week, and after the second day, this has been my permanent job, so they must have liked it. <laughs> when you started the business at 31, mm -hmm. you said earlier, by the time you were 50, you wanted certain things to be happening. I really didn't have the goals for size set as much as I had um, the goals to be non-dependent. The fun for me is to come up with a way to cookie cutter this process that we have now and apply it to other fields. Okay, okay. So what would you call that systematizing? You'd call it, it developing, a, a developing a repeatable pattern. Absolutely. Jim Shell has started and sold four businesses. He believes putting your ideas in writing is very critical to your success. I think he'll convince you a written business plan will help. Well, Hattie, a business plan is just exactly what it says. It's a, it's a road map to where you intend to take your business. Why do you need one? A couple of reasons. Number one, and first and foremost, it's a sales tool. If you're looking for financing, anybody that, that is gonna, gonna listen to you is gonna have to first see your business plan. So it's a financing tool, it's an exercise in planning. The first thing it's got to do, you've got to remember that that banker or venture capitalist or angel, isn't just bankers, are looking primarily at you, not your plan, not your, not your niche, not your product, but at you. So you have to make sure that the business plan focuses on you and your team, the team you're going to assemble, because they look first to your team. You also have to remember that that banker or angel is going to look at the preparation, actually the cosmetics of that plan, because he's going to say, if this is a well-prepared plan, then this person will run his business the same way. If it looks like yesterday's newspaper, that's the way he's going to run his business. Did you do a business plan when you started your first business? I like to say that I did, but I didn't. This was uh, 30 years ago or so, and uh, I had a relationship with a banker at the time. Um, I told him what I wanted to do. We he had some fixed assets. Bankers love those fixed assets. We had some fixed assets. I could give him a guarantee, so he was happy, so I did not. I wish I had of. It would have formalized my, the planning process for me and for my employees, but no, I didn't. Okay, so if I don't need the business plan to get money, then you just said another reason for me to have one is? Your employees, uh, so that they know where you're going, and also to formalize the planning process, to make you start thinking about some of the things that you might not otherwise think about. We entrepreneurs are a optimistic bunch, but whoever reads that business plan is going to want to know what are the downsides 
and we don't consider downsides. We don't like to. They're they're, they're not part of our of, of uh, what we're all about. But so it makes you consider things that you wouldn't otherwise think about mm -hmm. if you didn't go through the formal process. And it maybe gives the employees a bit of encouragement or security, feeling of safety. Hey, here's where we're going. And not only secure, but involvement. Key word, involvement. If you can involve the employees in, in a project like that, it, it kind of makes them, gives them a commitment to see that it happens. Okay, so, but you would advise anybody who wants to do a business to put it in writing, put the plan in writing. Well, it's a stronger word than advise. Either the do it or don't go into business. If you don't have time or the energy or the wherewithal to do a business plan, you don't belong in business. Writing a business plan will help you get started on the right foot. You want free information about that or other ideas for starting and growing your business? Give us a call, 1-800-449-9309. Writing a business plan can be easier when software programs integrate. Stephen Jackson computing. tells us about and, um, that, plus it's how it's many a, can be included in the writing and editing process. That, um, all you need to do is take the information that you want and, and pick it up, drag and drop it into, into your word processing document, and it's that easy. You'll see here in 123 that the cursor will turn into a little hand. So it's dragging. And as I click and hold with the mouse right. button, right. it grabs that little hand, grabs something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'll drag it down to the oh. Word Pro oh. indicator in the taskbar. Now, Word Pro is already it. open, ready to take this. In this case, I've already written already my letter, and I made space for this uh, graph to come in. Right. And now I just let go with my little hand. And there's the chart. And I, and I have a chart. And not only is it a chart, but it's linked. So that, in fact, if you, um, if you change the data in 123, it will change here. Your new word processing has some opportunities for us to share information. Can you tell me, you call it team computing? It's a business model. It's a way of doing business that's, um, that's seen as very, very powerful. In WordPro, we have a feature called Team Review. Okay. There are a number of, numbers of ways to distribute documents. You can just walk them around to someone else. Now, and what this, do you mean walk? I can't walk my <clears throat> pink pad around. I mean, you, we have to put you it on a diskette or something. Right. It would be sneaker net, right. What do you call it? Sneaker net. Sneaker net. Right. You take a diskette and you walk it. You walk to the person next to you and you say, "Here's the document, and, and would you open this up and take a look at it?" <laughs> so um, there's sneaker net. We can we can, uh, we can save this this document to the um, to the internet, and um, we can um, send this document via email. What is the most interesting part of this is that there are markup and revision tools that are available that are just very oh. much similar to your paper ones. Gotcha. That, that WordPro provides. Um, okay. So you have things like a yellow highlighter. It's a little little like. Oh, fun. You're going to make it yellow. Yes, and there are little comment notes. If I have too. a color printer, will it print the yellow or no? It will, in fact. <gasps> it can, in fact. I love it. So here we have, um, here we also have little post-it kind of sticky notes. And they're, in fact, rich text so that if you have tables in them, for example, okay. um, I, as the editor, when I receive a, a, a sticky note like that, I can drag that table out into my document if that's important information for me to use. Ah. So they're kind of cool that way. But okay. here's, the, here's the really wonderful part of this is the, is the consolidation part. So I will select Jeffrey and I'll select me, for example. Get some two people in there. And uh, what it's going to do is it's going to look, um, look at those two other documents um, and compare all the differences. In this case, for example, I, I have my original here that I'm reading, and I will say I'm going to reject my original and press that button to reject my original. I'll accept Jeffrey's edits. And that's the way the process works. That's fantastic. That's okay, so you got some clicking, you got so some words So two heads are better than one. Uh, many, many heads, yes, can be better than one sometimes. Yeah. You become a president once in your life, ever, and you should have something that's lasting and meaningful. On the day we went to Kansas City to, to meet Cheryl, she had just promoted three of her officers. Teresa Brimacombe is now president of NAIT. I think Cheryl is incredibly able to get all the other people who work here to buy into her vision. She doesn't want people to just get up and go to work. She wants them to get up and be excited about what they're going to do that day. Becky McRae, Cheryl's sister, is now president of the insurance agency VCW Inc. I mean, the idea that somebody bright, somebody who could work for anybody, chooses to work here, uh, is saying that small businesses can be the best place to be. Oh, they can be. I can be in an area where I have the opportunity, even if Cheryl wasn't my sister, she could see what I could do. She sees what all of these other people can do, and they get promoted because of it. And Hadley Rivick is president of Preferred Administrative of Services. Well, a lot of what I'm going to be doing is going out and selling the services that we currently have available to others so that they can use our third-party administration.
information services. You can have scary things happen at business that you don't understand, and I think to people you trust, you can admit you don't know, where otherwise you've got to have this facade of, I have all the answers which we frequently don't. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think the hardest thing for us to overcome was that she was my younger sister, much more for her than for me, because she always felt like everybody thought she got the job because she was my younger sister. Mm -hmm. If you knew me at all, you knew I wouldn't hire somebody just because you're, I mean, I, I could have every brother and sister in here in the business and don't. I have her. If you're starting a business, believe in it. You can't sell and grow anything. You absolutely don't believe in your heart that it's the right thing to do. And then when you start the business and you take on employees, don't forget that they're going to get you there. If you're online, come visit our website, sb2000.com. It's getting bigger and bigger every day. If you're not online, you should get online, but you can call us at our 800 number. It's free, 1-800-449-9309. Be here next week to meet two Jeffs. Their businesses are small, but all of their customers are big. Small Business 2000 is made possible by support from IBM, serving the needs of small and growing businesses, and Mass Mutual, the blue chip company, ensuring the success of generations of family firms and growing businesses for 150 years. For free information on starting or growing a business, call our toll-free number, 1-800-449-9309. And to order my book, Beating the Odds, or the companion videotape, call my office at 1-504-737-0076. You have to feel if you don't do this, your life will not be complete. Learn today, earn tomorrow.